welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Today on the show, we have Nancy Connolly. She's an internal medicine physician and she wrote the Kevin MD article, What if this physician had access to real solutions? Nancy, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. So we'll get into your article in a little bit, but first off, can you share your story and journey to where you are today? Yeah, so thanks very much for asking. So I started as an infectious disease doctor in Pittsburgh and moved here in 2008 and started working in a primary care practice. For about 10 years, I practiced primary care in a pretty conventional practice, seeing 20 plus patients a day and taking care of what they needed. About three years ago, I moved to the University of Washington to care for the homeless in our city. Homelessness is becoming a much bigger problem. In the homeless population, we find a lot of addiction, a lot of mental health disorders, and a lot of lack of social connectedness. And it's a different way to work. And I've seen similar problems, but with a different phenotype, a different manifestation of the problems. It's been a very interesting journey, and I'm looking forward to improving systems as I, as I do this work. So tell me some of the motivations that caused you to go from a traditional primary care practice into treating the homeless population. What were some of the reasons behind that? Traditional primary care is pretty challenging these days with having to see so many patients every day. And there's so much that patients need that we simply can't provide in the office because the infrastructure is not available. People suffer from loneliness and there's really not a lot you can do in a busy primary care practice to address that. And it impacts every single one of their physical, shall we say, medical complaints. And so I moved over to see sort of what systems were available for other populations offered by Medicaid and other public services to help people. I also moved to escape the productivity-based incentives that we worked towards and just to see a different system and a different population. Now, can you take us through, say, a typical day and perhaps some, uh, you know, without getting into too much detail, perhaps some common scenarios and cases that you might see? Um, We see a lot of people that are seeking rehab and we see a lot of barriers to getting them there. I see quite a few people suffering the effects of withdrawal and intoxication. And it's very hard to treat that certainly at the street level. You need to have facilities, you need to have detox facilities and rehab facilities. And where we have those, we have a lot of barriers getting people to them, not just like physically driving them, but there's intake procedures. There's something called a substance use assessment that actually is like a two hour interview that only certain people can do. So we see a lot of those barriers. We also see abscesses and urgent care issues. And we can kind of get to know people and kind of meet them where they are and try to move them to the next step. But that the infrastructure is really lacking. Before you treated this population specifically, you were in a traditional primary care practice. Did that prepare you for your current role? Well, I I think it really did because one of the things for people who have always treated the homeless population or the underserved I think that it's often underexpressed or underappreciated exactly how similar the populations are. People really have the same problems. We all suffer at some level from loneliness. Uh, mm-hmm. Vivek Murthy's talked about this in his book, his great recent book, Together. And those problems are the same. They just are worse in people who are suffering from homelessness. Obviously, they've fallen to the sort of the lowest rung they can get to. They're at the end of their rope. Hence, no social connectedness, which is why they become homeless largely. But the problems, the medical issues, the psychological issues are the same. All right. So let's transition into the Kevin MD article that you wrote. It's titled, What if this physician had access to real solutions? Now, for those who didn't get a chance to read that article, can you just walk my audience through it and share the story of why you decided to write it? Well, I saw a patient that day and I see patients like this pretty regularly who have interfaced a lot with the system through ERs or mental health hospitals or even primary care offices or jails or anywhere, social service offices. And they interface with those offices and they don't get the care they need. The ER is the best example. ERs that are incentivized to move people through quickly. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes in because of a cough, you know, they'll treat them with a you know, a chest x-ray and an antibiotic and get them out in 30 minutes. And that meets their criteria. But if they were to look at that person holistically and say, this person needs a home or they're going to come back to the ER, or this person needs, you know, some other type of service, whether a counselor or a social worker and connect them to that service, 
we would be serving people better. We wouldn't be meeting the current demands of our systems, i.e. getting people through ERs mm -hmm. quickly, but we would be helping our patients better. So this particular patient had been in jail, had been in a mental health hospital and, and hadn't received those services. And so keep sort of coming back again and again to the system and small things are addressed, but the big problem is never addressed. So what's preventing the emergency room from providing these services? Is it incentives? Is it a lack of budget and staff? What are some of the, the core reasons why these services can't be provided? Well, I think the, the fundamental thing is that the system's not designed to provide it. The system's mm -hmm. designed to churn people through quickly. The system's not designed to truly help people. And it's not the fault of the emergency room per se. It's the fault of the way we pay our emergency rooms, mm -hmm. the way the system is funded disincentivizes people from taking the time to really discover what the real problem is and address it holistically with a social worker or a counselor or connections to housing services. Short of completely changing the systems and incentives, like what, what are some paths forward? What are some tangible solutions that we can do to address these issues? Well, for example, as I stated in the article, one of the things that Medicare did a few years back was to create penalties for bounce backs. You know, if a patient yeah. was readmitted within 30 days, the, um, the hospital got dinged. They, they had a financial disincentive. And the hospitals then, and I was part of some of the groups that worked on this, tried to determine how to prevent people from coming back to the hospital. It involved creating safer discharges. And sometimes people stayed a little longer in the hospital while those were created. And so those kinds of things are helpful. i really think we need to fundamentally change our systems to incentivize healthy patients and mm -hmm. not incentivize time spent with a patient or medications or radiology prescribed. Well, I think that certainly applies to primary care. I think there's incentives, as you know, to see as many patients as possible, to do as many things as possible. We certainly live in a fee-for-service system. Now, is there anything that an individual emergency physician or urgent care physician can do in that short amount of time with a homeless patient to help alleviate some of the issues that you talk about? Well, I think I'm a big advocate for physician advocacy. And I think speaking out, out to the systems, to the designers of the system is an important role that we as physicians play. I know not everyone believes that, but, you know, I really think we need to speak up when we say, when we see things that aren't right, when we see ourselves churning patients through so quickly, we need to speak up and say, this isn't right. We need to redesign our systems to really harp our patients, not just run our systems. You know, on an individual level with a one-on-one -on -one patient, I think really all we can do is hold that patient's hand, show them that we care, encourage them to re-engage, not chase them away from systems. And I think patients often are frustrated by their interactions and don't come back. And then we lose our opportunities to help them. I think that physicians speaking up certainly has some resonance because that's really one of the most powerful ways that we can change the system. And I have a lot of physicians, of course, right on Kevin MD and appear on this podcast. What are some other ways that you recommend physicians speak up and use your voice? And can you share any stories or examples of, of physicians that you've come across who've done that? Well, you know, last year I participated in a physicians in doctors in politics workshop at society of general internal medicine. I think doctors should run for office. Mm -hmm. I think doctors should write letters to the editor. I think doctors should write letters to their legislators. I think we need to change the way medicine is funded. And I think doctors play a big role in advocating for that. We're listened to by the community. I mean, I'm impressed you have this podcast. You've obviously engaged full time in, in promoting physician experience and advocacy. And I think it's such an important thing that all of us need to do. Now, tell me some resources. Uh, you mentioned the Society of General Internal Medicine as, as one that workshop. Are there any other resources that the physicians listed in this podcast can turn to if they want to express their voice? Doctors for America is an organization that, um, again, Vivek Murthy, our current Surgeon General, he started, I think, eight, 12 years ago. Doctors for America is present in all uh, 50 states, I think, with different chapters, and they offer op-ed writing workshops and advocacy opportunities. There are, you know, state medical organizations. I'm a member of our Washington State Medical Organization Advocacy, and American College of Physicians has an advocacy arm. So there's lots and lots of ways to engage. Um, we have something called Washington Healthcare Alliance, which actually coordinates the, the efforts of various different organizations and specializes really in 
watching the legal legislation. We've had some really great legislation go through our state this year, um, trying to get towards more of a universal healthcare system. So I think actively being aware of that and engaging with that is an important component of, of helping our communities. We're talking to Nancy Connolly. She's an internal medicine physician, and she wrote the Kevin MD article, What if this physician had access to real solutions? Nancy, I'm a primary care internal medicine physician myself, but I don't nearly have the experience with the homeless population as you do. What are some tips and advice that you give me and other clinicians who may not have that experience with the homeless? Well, one of the most important things I think is to create a compassionate relationship. It's not different from what we do with all our other patients. I mean, these patients often have a lot of distrust for our systems, sometimes very rational distrust. They've they've often experienced hard times and showing them that we care about them and encouraging them to continue to engage. It's very frustrating dealing with our system for us as well as for them. Them and, and assuring them that, that we really want to help um, in whoever way we can. Are there any questions that we should be asking or any, any phrases that you particularly say that would have resonance? You know, I think just sincerely from your heart, there's nothing particular that I've learned, I believe, uh, about how to speak. They're like everyone else, the, mm -hmm. the homeless people. And I think I saw so much addiction in my conventional primary care practice. It looks different but addiction is a problem in our country, getting worse all the time. And it's something we really need to address. We need to destigmatize. It's a, it's a problem that affects really everyone. And so having compassion with that and understanding and helping people get the care they need is really just the most important thing. And my final question, what's your take home message that you want to leave with the Kevin and the audience? I think look at the systems, see where the systems are failing our patients. Do what you can to address the incentives and the metrics built into the system to help change and make more resilient, better systems for the health of all our communities. Well, thank you so much for sharing your time and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Oh, thanks very much.